Now he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began to pray in this regard, in a regard to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, crooked, adulteresses, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to raise his eyes toward heaven, but was beating his chest, saying, God, be merciful on me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified, rather than the other one. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. We're going to be spending our time uh, in Luke today, so if you want to open up your Bibles there to the 18th chapter, we'll be looking at parts of 18 and 19 in the Gospel according to Luke. Um, We've been studying on our Wednesday night Bible study, the life of Jesus. Uh, So if you've not been partaking in that, it's a good opportunity to start doing that. We're getting close to the exciting part, if you will, right? The the last week when all the action is really going to go down. Uh, So now is a good time to join. But... Uh, We've been looking, uh, as we've been going through that chronologically at different accounts, and and most recently we were looking in Luke 19, Uh, but as I was looking at that over the past couple of weeks, uh, I want to sort of look at these three different guys that show up looking for Jesus in Luke's narrative, sort of back to back to back. Uh, But before we do that, uh, he sets up his narrative in such a way Uh, that he starts it with this conversation of Jesus telling this parable about these two men who go up to the temple to pray, right? Uh, And so as you look at the Gospels and you you study each of them in turn, right, there's an interesting sort of way to do that. Uh, There's the way that we've kind of done it, I think, historically, which is we go in, we find a story, we look at it, and we look at all the accounts in the different Gospels, and we go, that was interesting. And we kind of move along to the the next thing might be, right, or whatever teaching we get out of that. Uh, but the gospel authors wrote their, 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 their letters, their narratives, their gospels in such a way uh, that they're trying to create a certain point, or they're trying to drive home a certain message to different readers. People go, why do we have different gospels? Why do we have so many, right? Why don't we just have one? Because that's how we would like it, right? Just give me one book that's exactly what happened, the way it happened, and that's all I want. Uh, but each of the writers is trying to do a different thing. Uh, and Luke, as he's looking at his, uh, his reader and his audience, is, is doing this thing that he wants them to understand that the things that you've believed are truth, right? That's sort of, the, he tells us that at the beginning. Uh, and then he goes about laying out certain stories of Jesus that focus on different things than perhaps John might focus on. And so as we get to this point, we look at these three stories of these three men, I think by looking at them connectedly, you're gonna get a lesson of what Luke is trying to drive home more than just, hey, this thing historically happened. Check it off the list, right? Uh, And he prefaces these three stories with this account of Jesus telling this parable about these two men. A lot of times we look at this parable and we'll say, this is good for our prayer lives, but in so doing, we miss the point because what he actually says is this is not about prayer. If you want to know about prayer, read the parable before that. Right. Uh, This story, he says, is about those who were self-righteous and had contempt on others. Right. That's the reason he tells the story, uh, Luke tells us. And the teaching that's very sort of clear in the narrative is at the very end of it that we just had. Right. Uh, That those who seek to exalt themselves will be abased and those who abase themselves will be exalted. And so what he's trying to drive home is sort of the upside down nature Uh, of what the kingdom of God is going to be like, right? The upside down nature sort of of seeking God and seeking Jesus. And and what he means by that is we don't find Jesus in being righteous. We don't find God in being righteous, which is a very interesting sort of uh, statement that he's trying to drive home there. But we'll see that as he then says, now let me tell you three vignettes, right? Three men who came looking for Jesus And let's see how this narrative plays out. And the first one follows sort of shortly after this. He has the story of the children, which again drives home, right? 
The kingdom's like little kids. The kingdom's like this, not like you think it is. And then he'll tell these stories. And the first one begins in Luke 18, verses 18 through 27. Uh, a story that's familiar probably to many of us, if you've read this before. There we go. Uh, and it starts like this. It says, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And so as we look at our first person, our first uh, character that's introduced here today, uh, we have this ruler that comes to him. If you look in some of the other texts, we'll call him the rich ruler, the young ruler, all these kinds of things. Uh, but there's a point that Luke is getting across here. He says, this ruler came to him. Now, as we look at each of these things, we're going to look at the way that Luke sets up these interactions similarly to each other. Again, because he's trying to draw our attention to What's the same between these interactions? What's different between these interactions? What's the message or lesson I should get from that? What's the truth I'm supposed to extract from those interactions by setting them up in a similar way like this? And so in each of them, I'm going to tell you, uh, sort of you can make a table if you want in your notes if you do that, right? And you'll see in each of them we're going to look at these different parts. And the first thing we'll look at is each of them start with sort of an opening address, or we might say, how did each of these men come seeking Jesus, right? When we look at this verse, when we see this ruler has come up to Jesus, and he approached in this way. He said, good teacher. Right? Good teacher. That's, that's the approach that he makes to Jesus. And so, in so doing, he tells us something about himself and his relationship to Jesus and who he thinks Jesus is. He almost sorts of thinks, and Luke tells us this, he's a ruler, and he approaches Jesus and says, good teacher. Now, what's the mindset there of this man, do you suppose, when he comes to Jesus in this way? What's the message he's conveying to him? What he's conveying is, look, I think you might have something for me, something I might need. Tell me what your wisdom is, and I'll go ahead and make evaluation of whether or not I think that's appropriate or not, because I'm a ruler and you're a teacher. So we're sort of on a level playing field here. Let's, let's have an exchange, if you will, right? And what's the desire? So what's the next thing that he wants? Each of these men comes to Jesus looking for something, and what's his desire here? Well, we look at his desire, and on face value, it seems like a pretty good one. It's what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, again, that seems like the right question to be asking Jesus. If anyone should know, he should know, right? And on its face, I think it's a good question. We would say, that's the question I would ask Jesus, right? Jesus, what can I do to have eternal life? And it's not until we look at sort of the next interactions that we see sort of the misplacedness there. But let's just leave it at that for a moment. He comes looking to Jesus for eternal life. And Jesus will have a conversation with him, and he will give him a list of things to do, right? Now, I don't know. You're missing sort of tone, uh, and you're missing sort of pace from the narrative, right? We could stage this as play many different ways. But I like to almost imagine the play this way, that Jesus is giving him his laundry list of things. Don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, on your father and mother. And I can imagine the rich ruler sort of jumping in, if you will. Like Jesus may not even been done with his list, right? Maybe there was more things he was going to say. But this guy just jumps right in with what? This is great. All of these things I have kept since I was a boy. Now what attitude does that sort of reflect from this man towards Jesus? What I'm going to suggest to you that the attitude that this reflects, and we'll see this played out in contrast in the future ones, so stick with me for a minute, I'm going to suggest to you that what he's doing is he's expressing the attitude that we just saw in the parable. Right? He's expressing the attitude that we just saw in the parable, which was, I tithe everything that I have, and I fast twice a week, and I do all of these things, right? 
And I think that's even reflected in his question. What was the question? What do I have to do in order to get eternal life? And as Jesus starts laying out the things, he jumps in. I've done all of these things since I was a boy. Aren't I righteous? Go ahead, give it to me now. And the response that comes back from Jesus, right, sort of hints at this attitude a little bit, because Jesus' response is not, oh, such faith I have never found in all of Israel. As he said at other times, right? What's his response? His response is, you lack. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that perhaps this man's never heard this statement in his entire life. Who has ever told the rich ruler that you lack something? He said, what do you mean? I have everything I want. I have power. I have prestige. I'm in a position of authority. I've got wealth. But I've got everything. What do you mean that I lack? But Jesus' statement is, you lack. I want you to take everything you have. I want you to give all of it away. I want you to give it to the poor. And then I want you to come and follow me. That's what you lack. Give everything away and come and follow me. So the thing you're missing is what? Have you ever considered that? When Jesus says there's one thing you're missing, what's the thing he's missing? The thing he's missing is he's not following Jesus. Did you pick up on that, right? He's not following Jesus. That's the thing he's missing. And the stuff is just getting in the way, right? Giving away his stuff is not a lack. Right? It's following Jesus that he's missing. And when he does this, as we look at this, we have the, the approach, the address, right? We have the desire, we have his attitude, we have Jesus' response. Now, what's the man's reaction? You'll see this in all of these stories as well. What's his reaction? The reaction says, he went away sad, or he was grieved, your translation right there. He was sorrowful, right? He was sorrowful, and we get the reason, too, because he had much wealth. And so we look at this interaction, we see this conversation with Jesus, and we have this play out. And the next thing we're going to see in each of these is we're going to sort of see the reaction of everybody else around. All right? So as you look at the next thing, what's the reaction of everyone else that's around there? The reaction that everyone else around is, who then can be saved? Right? And sort of the mindset these people have, effectively, I think, is this. They see this guy come up, they're like, ooh, this guy's, this guy's a somebody. He's a somebody. And he's got wealth. He's... he's you know, living large in life. And he's got authority. He's a ruler, it says. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, good teacher, what do I have to do? And Jesus says, do all these things. And he goes, I've done all those things. So like, he's a righteous man, right? And then when Jesus says, man, you're doing good. Just give it to the poor and come and follow me. Do you think the people around were like, oh, in order to serve Jesus, you've got to sell everything you have. Who can be saved? I'm going to suggest to you the people around were the poor. Right? They were like, well, that's easy for me. I don't have anything anyway. Who was following Jesus around? The people who didn't have anything anyway, right? And so they're, they're like, well, if the righteous, rich, religious person cannot be saved, what's for us? Right? If the best of us can't be saved, who can? And so what's the lesson that Jesus is trying to drive home? What's the lesson that Luke is trying to teach us by recording this story? The lesson is, as Jesus puts it, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What is impossible with man, God makes possible. That's the lesson he wants them to grasp from this, right? And in so doing, we get this introduction to sort of this upside-downness that we talked about back in the parable. What's the upside-down thing that we learn here? The upside-down thing that we sort of learn here is those who have must lose in order to gain. That's what he wants us to understand. Those who have must lose in order to gain. If you've got stuff, if you've got things, if you've got prestige, if you've got exaltation, if you've got these things, you must first lose it in order to gain Jesus. And friends, that's the sort of upside-down teaching in that time is expressed by their attitude. Who can be saved then? And it's an upside-down teaching in our day to too, right? Because when we look, what do we think you have to do? To, who's going to get saved? Right? Who's going to get saved? It's those people that are here looking good in the pews. Right? It's those people who have that are going to be saved, not those people who have not. 
It's those people who grew up in the church, perhaps. It's these people who are faithful that will be saved. What Jesus is saying is whatever you've got, you first have to recognize what? You're lost. You've got nothing. And if you don't recognize that, then it's impossible. It cannot be done without first coming to that realization. Now, as we don't ponder too long on that, let's move right along to the next story that he has to tell. Look, this moves us forward, and he tells us this story in verse 35 through 43. He says this, As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want for me to do to you? He says, Lord, I want to see. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. The next story that we get introduced to us very quickly is the story of the beggar. Right Now, some other uh, passages will tell us his name. His name is Bartimaeus. So if I say that, you're like, where did he get that from? It's in the other Gospels. Uh, but here he's just the beggar, right? Which, again, is interesting. Why does Luke just decide to call him the beggar? I'm going to suggest to you he's contrasting him with the ruler, right? And so he says a beggar came. And what's this opening address? How does he approach Jesus? Remember, the last guy approached Jesus like what? Good teacher. How does this guy approach Jesus? Son of David. What does that mean? What does it mean when he calls him the son of David? It means one thing and one thing only. He's saying, you're the promised Messiah. Right? That's who the son of David was that they were expected. You're the coming Christ. You're the one we're looking for who's going to deliver us. Now, how is that different than good teacher? Yeah, there's lots of good teachers. How many messiahs are there? Just one. What does he desire? What's he want? Well, we get it a little bit later in the story when Jesus asked him directly, but what does he want from Jesus? He says, Jesus, I want to see. Right? I want to see, Jesus. Now, again, notice what's a little different here. It's not, Jesus, what must I do in order to see? It's, Jesus, I want to see. That's what I want from you. And his attitude here is what? How do we know or recognize his attitude? His attitude that he comes to Jesus with is, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'm in a place down here, and you're in a place up here because that's how mercy works. You have something I need that I don't have. You have the ability to do something for me, and I'm asking you to look down on me with pity and look down on me with mercy. Have this for me. And how much does he want it? Well, we get some clue there because when he first asks, people say, shh, be quiet, beggar. And what does he say? It says he shouts all the more loudly. He will not be shut down. And Jesus' response when he sees this calling out, he sees this attitude, his response to him is what? His response to him is not, here's what you lack. His response is, what can I do for you? Right? You see the difference there between these two men? The first man was, what can I do? And Jesus' response was, you lack. The second man was, I have nothing, have mercy. And Jesus says, what can I do for you? And when he comes with that reaction to these things, uh, Jesus responds, what do you want me to do for you? We see this act of healing that occurs when he says, I want to see. And Jesus heals him. And the reaction from that, from this man, is quite different. Right? The first man was told, sell all and follow me. And we see he went away sad. The reaction from this man was, here's what you've asked for. I've given it. And what does this man do all on his own? It says he glorifies God, he praises Jesus, and he follows him. No invitation necessary. He just follows right along. He jumps in the crowd and goes. In fact, if we look at one of the other stories, we'll say that he takes his cloak and he throws it off. Probably the only thing he owned. Right? So whenever people say, oh, this guy didn't give up anything. He gave his cloak. Probably the only thing he had to go and follow Jesus. And the reaction then of others when they see this is quite different. Instead of saying, who then can be saved? Their reaction is what? says, they praised God also. 
They praised God also. Quite a different sort of reaction from the first man. Now, what's the lesson here that Jesus is trying to drive home? And then what's the upside downness that we see? The lesson here that Jesus is driving home, again, is in his own words to the man, which is what? Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. That's the lesson he wants this man to understand. It's the lesson that Luke wants us to grasp. It is our faith in Jesus that brings about a healing. And the upside down thing that we need to grasp here, especially when we see these stories set back to back and side to side, is exactly the story of the parable, which is what? Those who are the least will be exalted. Where was this man at the start of the story? Sitting begging on the side of the road. Where is he afterwards? Seeing and following Jesus, he's walking with the king. So the upside down thing we need to grasp is that those who are the least will be exalted. Now there's an interesting thing that happens sort of in the narratives and in the stories. When you look at the other gospels, uh, it seems that Jesus is leaving Jericho when he encounters this man. But Luke puts his story before the next story. Right? Which is an interesting sort of choice, I think. And the reason that's an interesting choice, I think, is because he's trying to set these two things up side by side for us to learn from them. And then he's going to say, now let me introduce you to a third man. And the third man he's going to introduce us through then is in Luke chapter 19 and verses 1 through 10, where it says this. It says, Jesus entered Jericho, was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was very wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a fig tree to see him, and since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here I now give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The third person we get introduced to, besides the ruler and the beggar, is the tax collector. We have this collector that is interacting with Jesus in this way. And the story is the same, and it's different, but we have this opening approach or address, which is quite unique, right? The first one, both of them call out to Jesus. How does, how does Zacchaeus approach Jesus? He approaches him by climbing a tree. That's his approach strategy, right? I'm going to climb up in this tree. Now, part of that, it tells us, is because he was a very short man. Right? And the crowd was too big, and he couldn't see Jesus. Now, there's something striking to me when I consider this sort of thing. I try and put myself in the place of what's going on. I see how the whole story plays out. And again, I'm speculating somewhat, but try and imagine it like this with me, if you will. This man's got some prestige, right? People know who he is. He's a wealthy man. It tells us that he's quite wealthy. It's just, he's a chief tax collector which likely means he's a tax collector over the other tax collectors in the area and all the taxes were come to him, which likely also means he's got some Roman backup and guard and authority there, right? And he wants to see Jesus. And he can't because he's too short and the crowd is big. Here's what I imagine. I imagine all these other people really don't like Zacchaeus all that much, as we see later in the story. And he's like trying to get up to the crowd, and he wants to see, and they're like, well, here's my chance to put one over on old Zacchaeus. Because I'm big, and you're little, and I'm not moving for you. Right? Because, you know, if a child came and wanted to see, or someone smaller came that people respected in the city and they liked, and they're like, hey, I'd like to see Jesus, but I'm too short. And I liked that person, what would I do? Oh, oh dude, come stand in front of me, it's fine. But he can't get through the press for some strange reason. Think that's accidental? I don't think so. So he could have done two things. He could have been like, well, nobody likes me here. Nobody wants me here. I'm going to go home. Or he has option two. Option two is to throw his pride out the door and go climb a tree like a little kid and admit, I'm really short. Yeah, I know and hang out in the tree and just hope to see him passing by like he's some poor commoner and not the chief tax collector of the region. So what does he do? It says he runs ahead and he climbs a tree. Now there's an interesting sort of thing that happens there. 
He exalts himself, but how does he do it? By humiliating himself. Right? And so we see this humble exaltation thing put side to side. And what does he want from Jesus? Now this is fascinating to me because the other two guys, they wanted Jesus for something. What did Zacchaeus want? Just to see him. I just want to catch a glimpse of Jesus. It doesn't appear he has any ulterior motives. There's nothing there in the text to suggest that. He just wants to see Jesus. Now again, that's fascinating when you consider the story that was just before, because what did that guy want too? He wanted to see. And so we have here a miraculous healing just as much as the blind man that we miss sometime, right? Luke is setting these up side by side for us to recognize the seeing of Jesus is a miracle. So he desires to see the Christ. And the attitude that he displays is an attitude of, I will leave the crowd and I will climb. I will leave the crowd, I will run ahead, I will make preparation, and I will climb to a spot to achieve the goal. Now what's Jesus' response to this? Again, he hasn't spoken to him one word, but Jesus sees by the things that he does, and he responds to him in some way. And the way that he responds shocks everyone, and it's this. He says, Jesus... Or he says, Zacchaeus, come. Come on down from there. Come through this crowd. Walk and get out of his way. Let him come down and come up to me. Why? Because I must stay with you. Can you imagine if Jesus said that to you, right? Isn't that what we're all looking for in our lives, is Jesus to say, I must stay with you. That's what we want, isn't it? Not Jesus' passing presence through town. We want him to stay with us. And he says, I must stay with you. Now, what's the response then that Zacchaeus has? How does he go, right? What's, what happens there? The first man went away sad. The next man uh, followed Jesus and was praising God. What's his response? It says that he welcomed him gladly. He gladly welcomed Jesus in. And to us, that seems like, you know, not that big of a deal. It's what we would all do, correct? Right? What was the response Jesus typically got? Well, sometimes he got welcome, and sometimes he didn't. But what's going to happen if Zacchaeus welcomes Jesus? What's everyone else going to think about that? We don't even have to speculate, because we're going to find out in just a minute. But what's the other response that Zacchaeus has to Jesus staying with him? We have a real act of true repentance, don't we? Now, notice he told the first guy, sell all that you have and come and follow me. And he doesn't tell Zacchaeus anything other than just make me lunch. And, and what does Zacchaeus say? Zacchaeus says, right here, right now, half of everything I have, I'm selling it and giving it to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone, if you've got receipts, come and see me. If I've cheated you, fourfold, I'll pay you back. We have true repentance being expressed here, don't we? He welcomes Jesus gladly, and his response is true acts of repentance and sacrifice. And the reaction of that to others, you would think, right, would be something quite great. Oh, Jesus has come to seek and save this one. But what's the reaction of the others when they see this? It says, they began to mutter amongst themselves. This man's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Right? Which is weird because effectively what they're saying is, look, I might have to rethink this whole Jesus guy. I mean, he's going to run with that crowd. I'm not sure I'm interested. I thought this guy was a righteous guy. Why is he eating with him? Doesn't he know better? Their effect to salvation coming to this man's house is, mm, maybe I'm not interested. I'm not so happy about that. And so what's the lesson we're supposed to gain from this as we see this play out in the way that it does? Well, the lesson, again, comes from Jesus. He tells us quite plainly, right? The lesson for us is salvation comes for those who are lost, right? Salvation comes for those who are lost. There's an interesting weird thing happening there in sort of the, the, the layout of what's going on. And, and Jesus saying salvation has come to this man's house. But who literally has come to his house? Jesus has come to his house, right? Go home and look up the name of Jesus because that's your homework. What's the upside downness that we see here then in this statement? What's the upside downness we gain out of this interaction that happens between them, especially as we look at it with the others? I think the upside downness we're supposed to gain and the lesson I'm supposed to take about this, the truth I'm supposed to gather, is that the Messiah saves those that we might reject. Right? 
How many people in the town of Jericho do you suppose were thinking, I mean, if Zacchaeus would only turn it around. I'd really like Zacchaeus to have good standing in the community, and I'd really like him to be accepted amongst our groups. And, you know, I think Zacchaeus could, could be a really good guy, and I think he'd be the kind of person who needs to draw closer to God. And I'd like to see that happen. How many people do you think were thinking that? How many think, people do you think were thinking as they were coming through the crowd and they were walking along with Jesus that day? You know what? If Zacchaeus could interact with Jesus, man, he could really change his heart. And I'd be happy for that to happen. I mean, we don't know the answer. The answer is how many? Zero. Right? Because when it happened, what didn't happen? When the blind man received his sight, everyone was happy to do what? Praise God. And when Zacchaeus gets to eat lunch with Jesus, everyone's like, Phew. they didn't want anything good for him. And sometimes when we, when we look at people, we see people in the world, and we look at them, what do, we, what do we really say about them? We say, man, they need the gospel. But I uh, hope they find it. <laughs> right? I hope they get it. <laughs> I'm not really that willing to go take it to them. Or we see people say, man, I really need the gospel. And they repent and turn around. What do we sometimes say about them? Yeah, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure how serious they are. Or, you know, I'm really not that happy that those people are getting out of this, right? We sometimes act like the laborers in the vineyard. What? Them? Why do they get salvation? So his answer there is we need to understand that Messiah would save those that we sometimes reject. And so as we look at these three things together, we sort of need to uh, ask ourselves, you know, it's an interesting sort of exercise we sometimes do. Who am I in these stories, right? Am I the ruler? Am I the beggar? Am I the collector? I'm going to suggest you you're probably none of them. Probably none of those people. Right? And I think Luke does something really interesting here because he always tells us the reaction of who. I'm going to suggest we're the crowd. Right? We're the people who weren't there at the time. We're the people that only read these things and see what's happened. And I think what he wants us to understand is, listen, you're the crowd. You're the crowd. You're those who are, who is the crowd? They're following Jesus, right? Isn't that us? We're the people following Jesus. And so as we're following Jesus, the lessons we're supposed to take and understand by this is, hey, the job is to save the lost. We're supposed to be happy for those who get salvation. The job is to turn ourselves over to Christ. The job is to let him live with us. The job is to not think of ourselves and what we do, but what Jesus does for us. And so, as he lays those things out, we need to really wrestle with and grasp that idea. Who would Jesus save, and what can I do? As Patrick likes to say, we're done with time, we're out of time, we've gone over, so we're going to go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come to you thanking you for uh, these lessons and these stories that Luke has written down for us and that you've preserved for us of the ages so we can understand and read. Uh, about these interactions that Jesus had. Father, we pray that we would never exalt ourselves. We saw that in the parable, that that's not how you want us to be or trust in our own righteousness. Uh, but we're grateful that we see that play out in the lives of these three men. Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand that um, the kingdom is, is upside down, is reversed from our worldly expectations. And so we pray that you would help us, uh, those who have, that we must lose, that we must give up in order to find your son. And we know that this is difficult, but we also know that all things are possible. Uh, with you. We pray that you would help us to understand and grasp this idea that as we humble ourselves, uh, you will exalt us, uh, that when we humble ourselves in the presence of your son, uh, that he will raise us up and he will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Uh, and we, we pray that we would have the kind of faith to understand and to see that, and that then our faith would be uh, strengthened uh, because we know it's faith that heals us. And Father, we pray uh, that as we think about those around in the world around us, that we would understand that salvation is for those who are lost and that we recognize that's where we once were, and we're so grateful that we're not there, Father. But we pray that you would help others to see that, that they are lost and help them to see their condition. And we know that you come to seek and to save those who were lost. And so we pray that you would help us uh, to rejoice and to be glad uh, when, when the Messiah saves those around, even those that we would uh, maybe reject, Father. And so we pray that you'd have, help us to have these hearts within ourselves uh, and that we would not be like those who mumbled or muttered. Uh, and said, why is Jesus doing this thing? But instead, that we rejoice uh, as those who rejoiced uh, with, with the blind. Father, we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We're going to sing a song here, Ferris Lord.